find a parallel, a parallel situation to our present situation to know what God will do in our present situation. And we find that um, what took place, what, what, what exists in the Adventist Church today and back in the 1950s in turn is an exact duplication of what existed back in the days of uh, Israel when Jesus Christ was upon this earth. Now, how did God solve the problem existing back in Christ's day? Very simply, he sent a messenger, first of all John the Baptist, to announce the coming of the real messenger Jesus Christ. And this messenger preached the gospel in the midst of this apostate church. He was a member of it, he was part of it there for quite, quite some time, in fact un until uh, his crucifixion really. Although Jesus Christ did have a definite separate organisation that operated within the framework of the church back at that time. And so God sent a messenger with a message and that's God's way of doing things and that message was the gospel. It was in effect the Laodicean message which was preached to the Jewish people at that time who were very much in a Laodicean condition. And the outcome of the preaching of that message was that a people were formed within the Jewish church organisation to begin with but as time went by they became separated. Now this group back there became blessed with three outstanding qualities or blessings. The first one was victory over sin. The second one was unity amongst themselves and, th and the third one was separation from the uh, organised apostate church system. Let's put those three points, points down. They are once again, I'll just put the initial because I haven't got, well maybe, maybe a space here. The first one is victory. Living personal victory over sin. The second one was unity amongst themselves and the third one was separation. Now when those three things had been achieved did God demonstrate his mighty approval of what took place? He did, but how? By the, by the unlimited outpouring of his spirit in the former reign. Now if God had not fully approved of the results of Christ's mission in that in the victory, the unity and the separation which those apostles enjoyed or entered into, then would God have sent to them the former reign? No, he certainly would not have. So let's write then the former reign up here. And this now gave another opportunity we might say for the work to be finished because if the apostolic church had not made the colossal blunder in the days of Paul of being more concerned about um, the consequences of Paul's teaching than they were about God's commands, then the church would not have apostatized, the work would soon have been finished and there never would have been a second day of opportunity down in our own time. Now if that's what God did back there, what can we expect God to do today? The same thing precisely. In other words, we can expect that as in the Adventist church we find a reproduction of the, of the situation back in the Jewish church that God would send a messenger with a message. And what would the message be? The everlasting gospel, which is also called the third angel of message in verity, which is also called the Laodicean message. And we should expect to find in, as a product of that preaching around the world, and, and it has to be worldwide because the fourth angel, and the fourth angel is the loud cry of the third, must go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. I think it's quite significant that the majority, in fact every one of the little offshoot movements, I'm not going to say the other offshoot movements, because we're not an offshoot. The Adventist Church is the offshoot, we're not the offshoot. Never, never say the other offshoots, just say the offshoots. Now all the offshoot movements from the Seventh Adventist Church organisation, there is not one of them which is a worldwide organisation today. The majority are limited to the country in which they began, namely mostly here in North America, particularly in the United States of America. We do have um, extensions of some of them in Australia. In fact, um, some of the so-called concerned brethren, men like Wheeling and... Um, uh, well, he goes to Australia occasionally. And uh, Santee and Bower's works appear down there, but you don't find them in Europe. You don't find them in Africa or in Asia or in South America. It's limited, limited to just two countries. But this movement to which we belong today, the, in which the accent is, first of all, what is, what is the first accent in this message? Okay. Victory, right. That's the first accent. What's the second? Unity. Unity. And what's the third? Separation. 
And this is the only movement today which is found on every continent on the face of the earth and all of open space for just a little over 20 years, which is an incredible achievement, possible only, of course, by the living power of a living God. And so today we find that there is developing the same victory, the same unity, and the same separation as marked the church back in the days of the apostles. Can we expect God to demonstrate his, his approval of this in due time? Can we? Absolutely. How will he approve of it? Exactly as he did back there. How do you do it back there? By the unlimited outpouring of his Holy Spirit and Pentecostal power. And what, what can we expect to see happen in the very near future so far as we're concerned? The same thing this time in latter rain power. In latter rain power. Now, as we look at this diagram on the board, perhaps I should write latter rain up there to complete the picture. As we look at this diagram on the board, we have no difficulty in seeing the truth of the words written in Great Controversy, page 343, where Sister Wise says, The work of God on the earth presents from age to age, 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 to age a striking similarity in every great revival and religious movement. The important God's dealings with these people is ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. Very good. Now that paragraph is obviously vindicated by the picture we have on the board today. There's one more point I forgot to make which I will make before I close out this particular presentation and it is this. There's a difference between the results of the falling away back in 606 BC and results of the falling away in the days of the Romans. Okay? And likewise between the falling away up to 538 AD and the falling away at the present time. Now when the falling away took place back in the days of Daniel, leading up to the days of Daniel, the people of God were taken away into a far country, weren't they? They were taken out of their own land and taken to far away Babylon. Many, many days of hard marching. Many, many weeks of hard marching. And likewise, during the Dark Ages, what, what did the Christians have to do about their own countries? Flee from them. The, um, that, this is how America first became populated because the first population in America was uh, through sort of the Pilgrim Fathers, a religious group of, of persecuted people escaping from the tyranny of the, of the religious persecutors. A little different from Australia. We began by having a convict settlement <laughs> which all nations seem to enjoy teasing us about sometimes in fact the New Zealander came across and lifted my trouser leg and looked for the marks of the iron shackles <laughs> but America had a good beginning in that respect that the first settlers were religious people who established religious freedom in, in this great land right then so um, we have the parallel flight from their own countries in both cases or, or being led, led away captive in their own countries in both cases but in the case of the Romans or, and, and the Jews the Jews remained in their own country and the Romans came in and occupied the country and became overlords over them which is a different picture of course from back here now at the present time <clears throat> let's turn to Daniel chapter 11 for a moment to get the um, evidence for this at the present time we find we're not yet obliged to flee. In the very end time we shall be, of course. But then we get beyond, we get beyond this parallel. We, 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 we get beyond the latter rain before that, that takes place. So we're sort of off the, off the board in, in that respect. But in Daniel chapter 11 we find that the, the king of the north will establish his, his palaces in the pleasant land itself. Verse 41, Daniel chapter 11. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. The word countries is supplied by the translators and therefore should not be there, so I drop it out. And many shall be overthrown. Those of you who have a revised standard version will read, and tens of thousands shall fall. Does anybody have one? Revised standard version? No one does. Okay, if you read it, you find it says tens of thousands shall fall. So here is the picture then of the king of the north, who is the papacy, entering into and occupying the glorious land, and not taking, God's, not taking the people off to, to a different land of exile. And so the parallel becomes uh, very interesting and complete there. Now here comes the good news, the nice part of the study. God foreseeing 
that the Jews would not avail themselves of their glorious opportunity. Remember the words again, 70 weeks are determined to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay? 70 weeks are given to do it. Just as you might say to a child, I'm giving you two hours to mow the lawn. Are you given in that time? Does that guarantee he'll do it in that time or do it at all? It doesn't, does it? And so when God said, 70 weeks are determined upon your, upon your city and your people to do this, there was no guarantee they would do it. And God foreseeing that they would not do it, foreseeing that there would be a falling away, subsequent to the, to the former reign, and the rebuilding of Babylon and the repeating of past history, said unto 2,200 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It will be done. Now, if God had foreseen, or, or let, me, let me put it this way, if this time the work is going to fail and we're going to go back through a third run of all this sad history, would God have known that? Certainly. And knowing it, what would he have predicted? A third day of opportunity, would he not? Not no afterthoughts. God tells these things far in advance. But where in the word of God do we find anything about a third day of opportunity? It's not there, is it? And as surely as it's not there, then just so certainly this time the work is going to go through and the word of God shall stand unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's good to know, isn't it? That's very good to know. It's an assurance that this time we are in the very last days of human history and the work is going to be finished in the very, very near future. Now this, this presentation of the two days of opportunity also brings to view the important truth that it takes time even for God to build a day of opportunity. Now for instance, how much hope was there of the sanctuary being rebuilt and the work of God restored during Babylonian captivity? None. God had to wait until Babylon's power was broken and the Medo-Persians arose who were prepared to listen to God's appeals and you know of course that back in Isaiah uh, 42 I believe it to be Cyrus was named before he was even born he was named by name before he was even born to be the rebuilder of the city of Jerusalem and when, when the I think Daniel himself personally showed this to King Cyrus he was greatly impressed and he said I'm prepared to fulfill my destiny because they were very superstitious back in those days and when when a destiny had been foretold through prophetic foretellings long, long before they dared not disobey. And so God had to wait until Cyrus arose. Then came the difficult task of, of separating many Jews from their, their adopted country. But finally, after many decades, God finally was able to start the work again. Now, likewise, during the 1260 years of papal supremacy, it was quite impossible for God to finish his work there. The people couldn't even be true Sabbath keepers. They couldn't worship God freely and completely at that point of time. So God had to wait until the play and counterplay of forces brought about the fall of Babylon and that, and then he could initiate the call to come out of her, my people, and begin that work. And of course, the Adventist Church has greatly slowed down the finishing the work by their later sinism. And now at last God, God is able to call out the people and let's pray we don't fail as the other ones have done. That this time let the work go through. And really we have no excuse for not being successful because, because never has the Sabbath rest message been so plainly and clearly taught. Never has the gospel been spelled out so clearly and effectively. Never have we seen the character of God so uh, comprehensively. And we have all the messages that we need to keep us on the straight and narrow path, don't we? Surely we do, as never before. So if we drift away, we, we should be the most inexcusable of all people in human history. Now we will move on now to the second study presentation, namely the marriage parable of Matthew 22. I think most of you have heard this one, but I think you'll pick up some extra points which will be of great value to, to, to you today as we pursue this study through. For the moment I'll leave this diagram upon the board because I want to demonstrate that uh, there is a, a very close relationship between the, the two parables, or the two prophecies rather. Let's turn then to the 22nd chapter of Matthew where Jesus gave the parable which he says reveal the nature of the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 22. Now this is a parable. It runs from verses 1 down to verse 14. The, the two parts to it, there's the two calls to the marriage followed by the coming in of the king which is the judgment scene. 
We'll read the parable first, making no attempt at all to interpret it. We'll just simply see what the parable says. Then we'll come back and um, place on the board the um, first points in regard to the parable, and then we'll see its application to back then and its application again today. But first of all, let me make an important point. This parable is so obvious, its message is so clear, the implications are so inescapable that those who are not prepared to accept this message deny the right of anyone to use the parable as a prophecy. They say all parables are just little nice homilies that are designed to teach us some little spiritual truths. You can't use them as an outline prophecy. And we're not fooled by that kind of argument because Jesus Christ himself and Sister White both use parables as prophecies. If you refer back to Matthew 21, for instance, you'll find that uh, in verse 33, Jesus says, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hasted it round about and digged, digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into, into a far country. Now, I think you, without my reading the whole parable, you recognize, of course, this is the parable that was first uh, delivered back in Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Do you, do you realize that? Back in Isaiah, chapter 5. And Christ was simply quoting an Old Testament scripture well known to the Jews of that time. And he quoted that one because he particularly wanted to use their scriptures to convince them of their dangerous situation. And in brief, the parable talks about um, the king sending servants to the husbandmen at the time that they might receive the fruit of the, of the vineyard. And the husband took the servants and beat one and killed another. And finally he sent his son and the Son, of course, was Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, this is a parable of events happening down through history. God called Israel out to be his people. He established them as a secure nation with a wall, a wall of protection around about them. He gave them his truth, symbolized by the vine and the vineyard. And then he went down to get the fruit of that vineyard and found only that his messengers were persecuted and, in some cases, killed. Last of all, he sent his Son, and the Son, of course, was Jesus Christ. So without question we have a very clear example of a parable being used as a prophecy in Isaiah 5 quoted by Christ in Matthew 21. And we shall see as we compare the notes in Christ Object Lessons that Sister White definitely deals with Matthew 22 as a specific prophecy and she matches events in Jewish history to the actual events portrayed in the prophecy. And after we get that far, if you're not convinced, and I'm quite sure you are already anyway, that... <laughs> that parables are prophecy, some parables are prophecies, then I don't think you could be convinced. So let's read the parable through, verse 1 to verse 10 for the moment. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which have bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things ready come to the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the women took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then said he to his, to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now there is the parable. Now I don't have two boards, unfortunately, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, I want you to remember, we're just jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit here, that the parable of Matthew 25, 22 covers the time from 457 BC till the, till the close of probationary time for the Jewish nation and the second application that covers the time from 1844 down until the coming of the latter rain. I have to clear the board now so we can put the next parable on but just keep those two points in mind and we'll see later how the two prophecies integrate to perfection and one gives more detail about a certain section of this original prophecy than is given by the prophecy itself. Alright, we'll now put the 
Words of stubborn. And what I propose to do is to, first of all, write on the board the actual events of the parable. And you watch me closely, of course, and make sure that I put down what the parable actually says. Then we'll turn to Christ Object Lessons and use that to match those events to historical uh, happenings. And then we'll take the third application for our own time. So here's the, the, uh, the parable itself. The first point is the king made a marriage for, for his son. So let's put here marriage. And this was made for his son. And then it says he sent for these servants to call them that were bidden to the marriage. And what about it? They would not come. So we'll call this then the first call. And let me ask you the question now. To whom was the first call carried? You lost the point already? No, no, let's keep, let's stay with the words of the parable for the moment. Uh, to the bidden ones, right? We, we, we're going to put down at the moment no application, just the facts of the parable. So the first call was to the bidden ones. Then it goes on to say, again he sent forth other servants saying, uh, tell them which were bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat things are killed and so forth. Now to whom does the second call go? to the bidden ones tell them which were bidden so this now is the second of the two calls now I should have mentioned of course that the first call met with a very definite refusal on the part of the bidden ones they would not come and the king must have been a very patient king which of course God is God being the king that's jumping ahead a little bit too and instead of wiping out or ignoring in the future these rejectors of his first call, he patiently sends a second call to them and says to his servants, Tell them which were bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattenings are killed, and all things are ready come to the marriage. But now what was their response? It was even worse than before. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And very obviously, of course, now that we are educated in the Sabbath West principles, which are the ways of God versus the ways of men, based upon the text in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 11, where God says, They have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. So when the text says, But they made light of it and went their ways, does, not, does that not indicate that they rejected God's appeal to go his ways, in favor of their going their ways. And their ways, of course, of building his kingdom, no less. But there's a second class of rejectors, and verse 6, And the Roman took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. So the, the rejection is very emphatic, so emphatic, of course, that it is final so far as the king is concerned. Now we move on to the king's response to this, and it says, And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murders and burned up their city. Now I'm going to cast this event right down to the end of the story, as you find Sister Wife herself does as well. So we just put here the word destruction of the rejectors. <coughs> and that, that took place right down at the end of the story because the Bible has a way of carrying one story right through to its end and coming back and filling, filling in whatever alternative may develop along the way. <coughs> now, it now says, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden are not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was finished with guests. Now it becomes obvious now we have in the marriage we have a very specific identifiable starting point which is followed by two events the first call and its rejection the second call and its rejection now we find a change in the picture at this point we find the following let's see the, see the picture clearly we find the king in verse 8 and to whom is the king now speaking? to the servants note the words then saith he that is the king to his servants about whom is the king talking about whom the bidden ones the king says <clears throat> they which were bidden were not worthy so we have now a picture of the king talking with the servants 
So he's with them. He is giving them commands. They're under his direction. Therefore, he, they, therefore they are his people. And there at a distance, the king looks over and sees the bidden one and says, they which were bidden, those people over there, are not worthy. Forget about them. Go to them no more, but instead go to a different class of folk altogether, those you find out in the highways and the hedges. So if I was to suggest now there's, 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 that there's a parting of the ways, let this line represent the servants, whom the king has commissioned to do his work, and down here the B.O. for bidden ones, then is not a definite separation suggested here, the king being with the servants, directing them, leading them, financing them and so forth, whereas the bidden ones are over in a different situation or a different place altogether, separate from the king and his servants, going their own way and, and no longer the interest of the king. Is that the picture? That is the picture. So they go out and we find now that we have the third call and the third call is to the highways and to the hedges. Right. And the result is of course success. The guests are gathered and when the guests have been gathered then the king comes in to see the guests to see if they're clad in the wedding garment. So we just put the word king here to mean the king comes in at that point of time to see if the guests are in the wedding garment. Now I want to ask you a very simple question. Have I faithfully placed upon the board today what the parable says? In other words, the marriage was made, followed by the first call and its rejection, the second call and its rejection, the parting of these two groups, the third call, the guests are gathered, the king comes in and then comes the destruction of the, bit of, of the uh, rejectors of his mercy. Alright, then if you're quite satisfied that's an accurate picture, we'll now turn to the first application which is given to us in the book Christ Object Lessons in the chapter entitled Without a Wedding Garments page 307 in the book uh, Christ Object Lessons now what we shall do is using the pen of inspiration we will now match the event in history to the prophecy itself but first of all the first paragraph on page 307 reads the parable of the wedding garment opens before us a lesson of the highest consequence. The highest consequence. Is there any lesson of greater consequence than that of the highest consequence? There isn't, is there? But I want to ask you the simple question. Back in your days in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, how many times were you, were you given a sermon or a lesson based upon the, the parable of Matthew 22? Never. Never, right? Even though it's a message of the highest consequence. Reading further, I should mention, by the way, that um, when I was a teacher still at the, at the New, Ze New Zealand Missionary College, I was commissioned to um, go to various churches on the Sabbath day to preach a sermon. All the teachers went around, went around the circuit of churches. It was about six or eight in the area. And there's a telephone, somebody. And um, I... Um, decided to take Christ topic lessons one day and just simply go through it and preach on what the wedding garment actually was. Not on not on this not on this aspect of the parable, just the wedding garment. Find the parable. Christ has sent out two groups of disciples. There was the twelve and the seventy apostles, and they have been sent out before the crucifixion and sister identifies their being sent out and now when was the marriage made to the Jewish nation? literally back in 457 BC because the making of the marriage is not the marriage itself the making of the marriage is the setting up of the conditions whereby the marriage can be developed and entered into and in 457 BC when God's folk were called out of Babylon and were commissioned to make an end of sins and bring an everlasting righteousness and of course the achieving of that would be the end of any separation between God and man and the marriage could be consummated as it eventually will be, of course. Now, further confirmation that that was indeed the first call is now given in the following words, and listen to them very carefully. It says, The servants were sent out later to say, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready come unto the marriage. 
Now, if, you, if you're familiar with the parable, you'll, you'll instantly identify those words as being either the first or the second call. Let me read them again. And you tell me, was it, is the second call or the first call? The servants were sent, sent out later to say, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready to come unto the marriage. The second. second, right. Very good, the second. Now, Sister Wise says, This was the message born to the Jewish nation after the crucifixion of Christ. In other words, between the years AD 31 to AD 34, we find the second call to the marriage goes at that point of time, given by, by Christ's disciples uh, along the way. Now then, I read further. But the nation that claimed to be God's peculiar people rejected the gospel brought to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many did this in the most scornful manner. Others were so exasperated by the offer of salvation, the offer of pardon for rejecting the Lord of glory, that they turned upon the bearers of the message. There was a great persecution. Many, both the men and women, were thrust into prison, and some of the Lord's messengers, as Stephen and James, were put to death. Thus the Jewish nation sealed their rejection of God's mercy. There's a couple of very important points to pick up here, and here's the first one. We, as Adventists, are accustomed, and rightly so, to expect... Uh, accuracy in the fulfilment of God's prophecies. In other words, there are one, two, three, four world empires foretold in the book of Daniel. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11 all predict the rise of four world empires. I recognize, of course, that by the time we come to Daniel chapter 11, one of them had passed away, namely Babylon, and so in the next three are mentioned, but it doesn't, it doesn't deny the fact there were four. Now, if history had produced five world powers, if an extra one has slipped in there somewhere, instead of the four that Daniel predict, predicted, what would you do with the book of Daniel? You wouldn't trust it, would you? You'd throw it out. And if, Dan, and, and if history produced three, where Daniel said four, what would be the story again? Same thing, you'd throw the book of Daniel out. Now, in like manner, this prophecy predicts exactly two calls to the marriage to the bidden ones. Not a third, nor a fourth, but only two. So when before the cross, the first call was given and rejected. Then what did the Jews still have coming to them? One more. One more but only one more. Not, no, no more than one. And if we should find that history provided three calls to the Jewish nation, another one subsequent, subsequent to the rejection of Pentecost, then how should we regard this prophecy? As being inaccurate, right? As being inaccurate and therefore completely unreliable. We would say that some... Uh, wily papist in the Middle Ages slipped it in there when he shouldn't have slipped it in or something like that we couldn't trust the, the prophecy at all now <clears throat> therefore when the second call had come to the Jewish nation and the second call had been rejected where did that place the Jews for eternity as a nation outside, outside right outside the call of God rejected. and pardon rejected. say again rejected, rejected right and um, in, in um, uh, contradiction to this, of course, modern religionists are predicting the return of the Jew to a position of, of uh, God's favoured people, predicting that they're going to go out and evangelise the world and, and again be the channel of light between God and man. But that is not supported by this particular prophecy. In fact, it's denied by this prophecy and will not come true. So then, um, Sister White confirms this by saying... Note the words. She describes first of all the second rejection. Then she says, "Thus the Jewish, thus the Jewish people sealed their rejection of God's mercy. The Jewish nation sealed the rejection of God's mercy. The result was foretold by Christ in the parable. The king sent forth his armies and destroyed those murders and burned up their city. The judgment pronounced came upon the Jews in the destruction of Jerusalem and the scattering of the nation." So as I said before, you find that the destruction element is taken right down to the end and here we have AD 70 when the city of Jerusalem was overthrown by the Romans and the Jewish nation scattered throughout the length and breadth of the earth. Now let's come back now and see if the picture I've drawn here uh, in regard to separation being pictured in the parable did in fact take place at, at, at this counter counterpart in history. Now if we look at shortly after the cross, right, we find that God has certain servants whom we call the apostles. And 
they were the bidden ones who were in turn called the, the Jews. Alright, so here we have the Jews in the picture. Now, do we find first of all that a separation did take place between the, the, the Jews and the apostles at this point of time? We do. Exactly, exactly where foretold in the prophecy. Because we have a definite starting point, the making of the marriage, a recognisable, identifiable first call on this rejection before the cross, and a confirmed second call on this rejection after the cross, and then we find that the Jew and the Apostle divided and went their separate ways. Now, with which of those two do we find the God of heaven? The Apostles who were the servants, weren't they? About whom do we find God talking briefly at that point of time and saying, those who have been are not worthy about the Jews. Okay? So the picture in the prophecy was exactly matched by the event in history. Wasn't it? Exactly matched by the event in history. In fact, the prophecy is astonishingly accurate in this respect. Now then, let's come back and look at the rejections of the second call. And do you remember the two different rejections given to us in the Bible? What were they? The first one, the first one was they made light of it and went their own way. What was the second, reject, second type of rejection? Persecution. Okay, persecution. They took them, they treated them spitefully and they slew them. Alright, so you've got those two in mind. One, they go their own ways. Two, they persecute. Two different classes. Now here Sister White lists likewise two different rejections. She says, first of all, many did this in the most scornful manner. Others persecuted. So, that, so were there three altogether? Let me list the three. One, they made light of it and went their own ways. Two, in the most scornful manner. Three, they persecuted. Were there, were there three different ways? Were there? No, there weren't. No, there weren't. There were two ways. Two ways in the Bible, two ways in the spirit of prophecy. Now, even though Sister White used different words from the Bible, her words are describing one of those two ways listed in the Bible. Now, what are the two ways in the Bible again? They made light of it and went their own ways, and they persecuted. Sister White says the most scornful manner and persecution. So the most scornful manner can't be persecution, can it? Can it? No. So what is the most scornful manner? To make light of it and go your own ways. That's the most scornful manner. Now when you make light of it, you're simply dismissing the whole thing as being unimportant. And um, your own ways as being much more important. Now, whenever a person then elevates his own ways of being of so much more importance that he goes that way of his own instead of accepting God's call to him, then is that not the most scornful thing a person can do with God's truth? Isn't it? Absolutely. Now, um, we'll pick up this point later, especially in respect to the rejection of the second call in 1962 and demonstrate how the attitude of the leading men at that time was exactly that. They treated the thing with scorn and went their own ways, maintained their own programs and completely ignored God's call right down the line. Now then, <clears throat> let's now just finish out the, the last bit here quickly. The third course is to white service to the Gentiles, page 309 in the book Christ Object Lessons. The third call to the feast represents the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles. So here's the third call at this point to the Gentiles. And it was God's intention, of course, that the guests should have been gathered at this point of time <coughs> by the apostles and the work finished at that point. But unfortunately, of course, the apostolic church fell away and the guests were not gathered. And because they, because they weren't, then the marriage could not be consummated. The king did not come in in the investigative judgment and therefore this first application is slightly incomplete. And because it was incomplete, it became necessary for God to institute a second and final application of this prophecy. And this time, of course, in the second and final application, the work is going to go through to glorious completion. Now, I have two minutes left, so I'll just make a point in closing. It shouldn't be difficult now if we, if we just run back and see that the last study which we had, the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, the 490 years that go into AD 34, it should, be hard to, it should not be hard to recognize that Matthew 22 is a more detailed presentation of the period from 457 to 34 AD, with the cross of course right down toward the end of that period. So here we have a more detailed presentation between there and there of the first prophecy. And of course that makes two witnesses that are confirming the same great truths 
and uh, make it pl make, making it plain for us to understand what the prophecy is all about. Now this evening we'll come to the climax of this presentation in the study of the second and final application of the parable of Matthew 22 and this time it will be complete. The gospel will go to the Gentiles, the king will come in and investigate judgment and sin will be brought to us in an everlasting righteousness shall be brought in. But for now my time is virtually gone so I'll stop at this point and we'll pick it up this evening and complete the study on Matthew 22 at that point of time. Any questions you'd like to ask anyone to clarify what you've heard? Yes. Yeah, uh, when you were finishing up the first study before you got into the uh, Matthew 22 there on the two days of opportunity, uh, can we be successful as God's people? I, I just kept thinking about what you introduced on Friday night, the update that you brought in on child salvation. Can we give that complete witness before the world if our, ch our own children aren't? No, no possibility. No possibility, really. Uh, if an odd family in the group, of course, is, of, of foolish virgins don't succeed, that, that wouldn't stop the general group from succeeding. But um, unless the message on child salvation is implemented by at least the majority of parents successfully, then they certainly could have proceeded with a larger mission work outside the home. The, the mission work in the home must be completed first. The first work must be done first, and then God will give it to us a larger field of, of, uh, of success. Yeah. I would like to know more precisely how this revelation came to you of the application of the two calls. Well, that's a very hard question to answer because it just seemed to arrive one day. Um, leave the question if you don't. Remind me of the question again when we get to Matthew 25. It'll be easy to answer then. But, um, well, I'll answer it now up to a point. And maybe, not, maybe, maybe we'll repeat it again later. But, um, when, when we left the church, we left on principle. We read in, in 1 John chapter 4 that if anyone comes to us seeking that Christ came in sinless flesh, that this is Antichrist, we're not, we're not to stop with them or to entertain them in any way whatsoever because that would be to partake of their evil deeds. And when we were called upon to either renounce the message, message or leave the church, we said we won't renounce the message so we left the church. We went through some very difficult times then. We did not know these prophecies at all. We knew nothing about this whatsoever. And we got to a certain point, the same point where in early writings, the believers back in 44, saw the Tower of Matthew 25 and knew where they were. And these prophecies opened up to our minds. I can't tell you how now. It just seemed to arrive bit by bit. And when they did, we suddenly recognised we, we had walked down a, a predicted pathway with amazing accuracy, without knowing it. It's a bit like uh, searching out a destination that's far away and then you suddenly given a map and you check the map and you say, well, my mate and I have followed the right trail all the way. And you feel very, very, very reassured. And so did the folk back in 44. And my answer will become much, much more meaningful to you when we do get to Matthew 25 and, and we, we point out the point in the prophecy where the folk back in 44 saw where they were and we likewise saw at the same parallel point in our experience. Yes. 